All right, greetings A Life Online and my Knights of the Square table. <laughs> um, like last week, we finished off the book of James. Um, it was an amazing time. We had a, uh, took about three sessions, but we got it done. We learned about faith, faith in action. Um, more about the fruits of the Spirit um, and how Sue likes to kick puppies. We learned all those things in there. Yeah, was, some of you look surprised. you got to show up every week to Bible study so you can understand. Uh, you, can ask, you, can <laughs> you can ask her afterwards about it. We've all prayed for her. So. No, I'm kidding. You guys online, no one kicks puppies, not in the church that I know of. Um, we're about to dig into one of Paul's prison epistles. It's going to be the book of Ephesians. Um, it was actually written to the Bur- B- B- that's going to be one of those days for me. It was written to the church of uh, Ephesus. It was around 60 A.D. probably. Now, while being written to the church of Ephesians, uh, many people believe it was meant to be a circular letter. That means it was to be circulated and read uh, to multiple churches uh, because it describes the believer's exalted position in Christ the church as the body of Christ, <clears throat> the church's relationship to God, um, and practical implications of living as the children of light uh, through our faith in Christ. The book of Ephesians hits me specifically because it exalts Jesus above all things. Um, and as we know, especially around this table here, that Jesus is all things. So it's so important to just remember that, remind ourselves um, and the really neat thing, a way to approach <clears throat> the book of Ephesians, uh, Ephesians pardon me, is um, a lot of biblical scholars and theologians actually describe each chapter, chapter of this book as different areas of the holy temple. Um, and it's really neat when you absorb the book in one sitting and you do it like that. Um, once we get through a chapter or two, you'll start to understand why they do it that way and you'll see it. But chapter one is the anteroom of the holy temple. Chapter two is the audience chamber. Chapter three is the throne room. Uh, chapter four is the jewel and the dressing rooms. And uh, chapter five is the choir and the oratory rooms. And it's just really neat uh, if you dig it in. And I encourage, <clears throat> it's going to take us two or three weeks to get through this book. Um, but just going back and reading it in one one solid read um, and letting the Lord speak to you through it. Um, it's just amazing. But enough introduction. Let's pray and we'll dig into chapter one. Most glorious, wonderful, heavenly Father, Lord, please soften our hearts and prepare our spirits so that we can receive your word and store it within ourselves, Lord God. Encourage us to share what we've learned uh, with anyone willing to listen, Lord God. Encourage us to go back and read it ourselves so that your spirit can speak directly to us through that Holy Scripture, God. Um, Lord Jesus, we want to pray for Afghanistan right now. Uh, you know what's going on there, Lord. We know that your hand is there, but we just uh, we lift that country up, uh, our people, their people, all people, uh, onto our shoulders just so you can see them and minister to them, Lord God. Please lay your spirit heavy on that country right now and comfort the families that are going through all the different sorts of crises right there, right there right now. Lord Jesus, we love you so much, God. In the holiest of the holy names we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Um, <clears throat> in this first verse, we're going to hear Paul, uh, Paul's uh, address. He tr- addresses specifically the church um, of Ephesus, which actually wasn't present in earlier manuscripts, which is why a lot of the early theologians uh, think that it was more meant to be more circular. It was meant to be uh, distributed to all the churches. Uh, Paul also, which is in contrast to some of his uh, other letters, mentions no particular problems or local situations that he was dealing with. Uh, so he really was just talking to all the churches. It's so important to remember when we do go through all the epistles and all the books in the New Testament uh, that when they're speaking to a specific church, we are that specific church. We are the body, uh, and Jesus is the head. So let's go ahead and dig in. We're going to get uh, one, and we're going to read one through three. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, I'll tell you what, if you guys ever write, I know writing letters is a lost art. I think we need to bring it back a little bit. Um, Just getting a letter from someone feels so good, even if you're just saying, um, hi, how are you? I'll tell you what, when I was uh, imprisoned, my aunt, uh, Aunt Kimmy, would write me every single day, every day. 
And a lot of times it was just about, uh, hey, this is what my cat did today. Hey, this is what, what happened today. And it was such benign information, but it really warmed my heart. It made me feel like I was there. She was with me. Um, and so if you know a brother or sister that's going through something right now, then write them a letter and just be like, hey, what's up? I love you. I know I saw you last Wednesday, but... I just wanted to say I love you again. How are you? How's your family? And maybe they'll write you back, and you guys can start corresponding in that such awesome way. Um, and, th and that's why this paper here, the way Paul writes, is just timeless. But I was going to say, if you guys are ever to write me a letter, you, you make sure you start your letter like that. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I just love the way Paul t starts his letters. And if you ever notice, when you read his letters, he starts out by giving thanks to God. Always thanks to God. That's how he starts his letters out. Um, I sure wish that I had someone uh, sitting with me and explaining the book of Ephesians the first time I read it, because it is intense. Uh, I, I read the entire thing. I put it down. I shook my head. And then I read it again, and I still didn't understand it. <laughs> so and there's just so much depth and brevity to it. So we're going to uh, kind of take it verse by verse in the very beginning because you kind of have to uh, the way Paul writes it. Um, but blessed in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing. Uh, what does Paul mean by that? He means that in Christ we have all the benefits um, of knowing God. And what benefits is he talking about? He's talking about um, tons of them. Uh, you, I'm sure you can think to yourself and think, these are the benefits that I reap from knowing God. Uh, but Paul, what he covers in this letter are the benefits are uh, being chosen for salvation, being adopted as his children, God's children, forgiveness, insight, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, the power to do God's will, and the hope of living forever with Jesus. That's why I say always go back to this letter. If you're starting to feel like you're slipping um, or you've forgotten what's waiting for you, go back to Ephesians. Um, and this is just the beginning of the letter, and he's already thanked God and told us about our spiritual blessings in Christ in one verse, in verse 3. Um, when Paul says the heavenly realms, what he's doing is he's stating that the blessings he's talking about that I just mentioned um, are eternal and not temporal. That means we take it with us. The only thing we take is our wisdom and knowledge of God and the love of Jesus Christ. Um, so as I said, we're going we're gonna to approach it verse by verse here in the beginning. Um, Paul has this amazing ability to pack a massive amount of spiritual meaning into one sentence. Um, and it's Paul, so one sentence could be 50 words in it, but it's impossible to group them together while grasping their true meaning. So let's go to four. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now I'm going to let that in love part uh, rest until the next sentence because that belongs to the next sentence. But chose us in him means that salvation depends totally and completely on God. We're not saved because uh, we deserve it. It's because God is gracious and he freely gives this to us. Um, we did not and cannot uh, influence God's decision to save us. He saved us according to his plan. Um, the mystery of salvation, you'll hear him say it a few times throughout the book, um, can never truly be understood because it was developed. And get this, I've been trying to wrap my head around it forever, um, but I can't because it was developed in the timeless mind mind of God before we even existed. Um, so as I've said before, I mean, I, I, how many of you have sat here and, and, you know, tried to imagine what it was before God? It'll just blow your mind. You'll, you'll short circuit because you can't. Um, uh, it, it, it's hard for our tiny human brains to understand how God could accept us. But as Paul's saying here in four, he chose us and we belong to him through Jesus Christ. God looks at us because of Jesus Christ as though we've never even sinned. Um, all we can do is what Paul, uh, go back to three, all we can do is what Paul did in verse three is, is express our amazing love for him. Praise to you, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in his heavenly realms. That's why I say every good prayer starts with a thank you. Let's go to five. <clears throat> uh, five, Jonathan, sorry. He predestined us for adoption to the sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Uh, I forgot about the in love part. It's so important. It says in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship. Um, now there's a lot of people that take this verse and a lot of other verses that say predestined um, 
for the determination that uh, you are predestined before birth to either go to heaven or hell. There's a whole uh, group of religious leaders that believe that's what that means. Um, but predestined simply means in the Hebrew uh, and the Greek form, it means marked out beforehand. Um, that's all that means. Uh, through Jesus' sacrifice, uh, God brought us back into his family and made us heirs with Jesus. Um, Paul uses this term to show our relationship to God. So uh, read into it as much as you want to. That's what God's word's for. But in, in no way, you didn't come out of your mother with a stamp on your forehead that says heaven or hell. And uh, people that tell you that just don't believe them and point them in the right direction and say, this is what this means. Um, I have free will. God loves me. He wants me back into his family. So I accepted Jesus Christ. We're going to read 6 through 7 now. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. I love the way he says that. With all wisdom and understanding. Um, Jesus' blood was really important in the first century uh, to talk about it. It was talking about Christ's death. And so when we're talking about Christ's death and the understanding that Paul's giving to us, um, it's pointing to two truths, two amazing truths, uh, which is redemption and forgiveness. Uh, and they're two different things. They sound the same, but they're not. Um, redemption was the price of re uh, paid back then. Redemption was the price paid uh, to give uh, to gain the freedom of a slave. Literally, if people had a slave, you could go and pay that person enough money and free that slave. So through his death, Jesus paid the price to release us from our uh, slavery to sin. That's what that redemption means. Now, forgiveness was granted in the Old Testament uh, by shedding of animals' bloods. Uh, but now we are forgiven on the basis of the shedding of Jesus' blood, who was just the, the perfect uh, sacrifice for us. Let's go to 9. We'll read through 10. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. 10. To be, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. That's important. We'll come back to that in a second. To bring the unity to all things in heaven, on earth, and on earth under Christ. So when Paul says the mystery of his will, um, you hear that a lot in the New Testament. He's not saying that God intentionally kept his plan a secret, um, but God's plan for the world couldn't be fully understood until Christ rose from the dead. We didn't even know what he had planned to do until that happened. Um, God's purpose for sending Christ, if we look at it in this way, was to unite the Jews and the Gentiles uh, into one body as Christ, as Jesus, as the head. Um, and a lot of st people still don't, I still don't, understand God's uh, mega purpose, his ultimate plan. Uh, but when the time is right, that's why I said this is important, when the times reach their fulfillment, uh, he will bring us together with him forever. That's when, when, when that's something that snaps into your life or your prayer is answered. You have that aha moment. You're like, oh, this is what you were doing this entire time. I get it now. I understand. Um, but I'll tell you that right now, in that same day, when that reaches its fulfillment, everyone will bow before Jesus. Uh, now, it's either because you love him or because you fear his power. Uh, that's, that's, that's either beautiful or absolutely terrifying. But I, for one, and I know you guys too, um, are incredibly glad to be a part of the former group because we love Jesus. That's why we want to bow. We bow because uh, we want to bow. Let's go to 11. We'll read through 12. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. 12. In order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. I love that God's purpose um, he talks about God's purpose, God's purpose, God's purpose. Well, what is God's purpose? It's to bring salvation to the whole world. There's too many people that misinterpret what God wants, like he's selecting only a few, or he's picking out these predestined group of people. No, God is sovereign, okay, which means he is in charge. Uh, when you get to one of those panic moments in your life, uh, then you can rest in this truth that Paul's trying to build a word picture of. Jesus is Lord, and God is in control. 
Jesus is Lord and God is in control. I'll hit you with another truth. Uh, God's purpose to save you cannot be thwarted. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that people can say or do. There's no evil that Satan can throw at you that will change God's master plan. It is infinite, it is powerful, and it is permanent. Jesus is Lord and God is in control. That's why I, I use that analogy of that boat upstream thing. You can paddle against the current all you want to, okay? But God's purpose is permanent and infinite. So if you know these facts, why not just sit back in the boat, have a glass of iced tea, and relax while God takes control of your life and just works you down that stream. And you just continue thanking him and say, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing right now. I know what I'm going through is hard right now, God, but your plan is permanent for me. So I just appreciate what I'm going through right now, God. Let's go to 13. It's going to start talking about the Holy Spirit here. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him. I love that, marked with a seal. What is that seal? The promised Holy Spirit. 14, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of his glory. What's amazing is that anything and everything in this life, you can end your sentence with the praise of his glory. Like I woke up this morning. Why? The praise of his glory. Uh, I got a promotion at work. Why? The praise of his glory. Everything is done for the glory of God. And the faster and sooner you start realizing that, the easier life's going to be. You can start giving your will up to his will. Now, the, the Holy Spirit is um, so many things to us, but what Paul's trying to show here is that the Holy Spirit is also God's seal. I just love the way he says that, that we belong to him and his deposit, okay, guaranteeing that he will do what he promised. That's what the Holy Spirit is. When he said he deposits, uh, when he says he deposit, he's saying that the Holy Spirit is like a down payment, you can call it that. The Holy Spirit is a down payment. It's a validating signature on the contract is what he's doing right there. He's fulfilling what he promised he would do. Um, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, that's why anyone says, man, I feel convicted what I'm doing. I'm like, good. They're like, good. I'm like, yes, it's proof that the Holy Spirit's working in you. The presence of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of you, in me, is proof of the genuineness of our faith. Have you ever think you're lacking faith? Guess what? You won't be concerned about lacking faith if you don't have faith already. I know that sounds crazy like I'm talking in circles there, but God's not going to come to you, speak inside your heart and say, look, you're slipping a little bit here if he wasn't there to begin with. So don't doubt your faith if you're doubting your faith. If you can wrap your head around that. <laughs> but um, the Holy Spirit also proves that we're God's children and helps secure us for eternal life. All this is, is contained in what Paul's saying to us right here. The Holy Spirit uh, proves, or he works in us to transform us now, but what he's doing now is just a taste of what we're going to experience in eternity. That little tiny thing that you're feeling right now, that Holy Spirit, just imagine an explosion of that. That is what you'll experience in eternity. Um, this this sounds kind of this might sound kind of silly, but um, I've had this smartwatch for like five days now. It reminds me of the Holy Spirit. Why? Has anybody here ever left their home uh, or their phone at home on purpose? No. Thomas is like, I can't. <laughs> yeah, you know, Chili's is going to implant one in the back of his dome, so it just rattles him every time it rings. Um, but I did that yesterday uh, before going to the store. I was only going to be gone for 10 or 15 minutes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. I was like, you know what? I'm going to have a little taste of freedom. I'm going to leave my phone at home. Um, and it, I was in the store for about three minutes, and my watch buzzed. And I was like, oh. oh. And it just it follows me everywhere, 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 everywhere. But that's the that's, um, that's spirit, too, though. That's the point. You can leave your phone. You can leave your Bible at home. But guess what? You carry the Holy Spirit with you. And no matter where you are or what you're doing, he's going to buzz you and say, look, you need to do this now. Or you need to go talk to this person. Or this needs to happen. That Holy Spirit's inside of you. And as soon as you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, there ain't nothing you can do about it. All right, let's go to 15. 
I love this. This is the way we should all be praying for each other. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. 17, I keep asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. What an amazing prayer. I mean, just that alone, if you were to pray that one thing alone to each one of the church members, I mean, can you imagine how much their lives would change? Every Sunday morning, uh, uh, pray for me and say, Lord God, help the pastor go slower so my hand doesn't turn into a horrible cramp while I'm trying to take notes. <laughs> Jonathan has to put a little piece of paper up there to slow, slow down. Let my, let my brain consume something. Let me meditate on this. Please slow down. Um, but Paul was praying more than importantly than all this that we're reading in this. Paul was praying that the Ephesians know Christ better. Christ is our model. We remember that. We know that. So the more we know of him, the more we will be like him. It's just amazing that we can uh, get our Bibles and we can read what Jesus Christ was like almost 2,000 years ago. And it's also amazing that we can get to know him now. How do we do that? Through prayer. You pray to the Lord Jesus. Guess what? He's going to talk to you and he's going to tell you what he expects of you. And he's going to tell you what's going to happen in your day tomorrow. Um, so get to know him now through this. Get to know him through prayer. And as you guys already know, the personal knowledge of Jesus Christ is life-changing. It'll change you every single day more and more and more the more you learn about him. Let's go to 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. I just want to stop right there real quick and say uh, the hope that Paul is talking about isn't some uh, vague feeling that the future is going to be good or positive. Um, it's the complete assurance of certain victory. That's what's amazing that you know that you have in God. It's through God that certain victory is. So if you try to achieve certain victory without God, what kind of victory is that? Let's go to 19. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Uh, what year was the atomic bomb dropped? Does anybody remember? Yeah. Was it the 40s or was it? Regardless, once that one thing happened, everybody in the world, still everybody in the world, fears that power of the atom. We think at any, any moment, I mean, they would run drills and kids would get under their desks and people were just terrified of it, um, how amazing that power is. Um, but speaking about amazing, how amazing is it that we belong to the God of the universe that not only created the power of the atom, but raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Now that's power. Now guess what? Uh, we have that same power available to us. Now you hear Christians say that all the time, like I've got real power. And they're like, well prove it. And they're like, let me give me five minutes. I'm going to pray for you and let's see if your life changes. Because it will. That's the power we have. Um, I try and remind myself of that every single time I'm in a situation that I can't handle. I think the God, that's the, that's the second cell phone. All right, clear out. No. <laughs> clear out. We're done. <laughs> Ushers. <laughs> play a dirge Thomas play a dirge on the piano as we all file out the door no I'm kidding a dirge like a death march <laughs> wait is that Star Wars <laughs> now everybody knows I'm a, I'm a nerd okay well oh boy let's go to 21 <laughs> Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is involved or invoked, not only in the present age, but also the one to come. We're going to read through 24. And God placed all things under his feet, under Jesus' feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. 23, which is his body. That's so important to remember. That's what we are. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. 24. What? Oh, no, that's the end of the chapter. Anyways, <laughs> I don't know. 
Let me check to make sure. Oh, Jonathan, you're right. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, fullness um, in the context, when he's talking about fullness, what Paul was talking to, um, he was referring to filling the church with gifts and spiritual blessings. That's what that fullness was. Now, I'm saying that the church should be the full expression of Christ. We can't remember that we're the body of Christ. Why? Because Christ himself is everything. We have to keep remem- reminding ourselves. That's why it's important to read this thing. Um, that's why I, I, I uh, mentioned that we need to remember reading Ephesians, that it was written to the entire church. So every time he says, you, 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 the church, the church, the church, he is talking to you. Christ is the head, and we are his body. Um, Paul uses this same metaphor uh, in Romans, 1 Corinthians, uh, Colossians, um, but the image of the body, what does that do? Why, is, why does he use a body metaphor? Um, that's the unity of the church. Each member is involved uh, with all the others, all the others, as we go about on this earth doing Christ's work. That's what we're here for. Um, we should never try to work, serve, <coughs> worship, minister, uh, do any of those things on our own or by ourselves. That's not what we're here to do. God put us here to be with each other to do it. And besides, it won't work if you try to do it yourself. Just like you can't do anything without God, we can't do anything without each other. That's why we all come together every Sunday, every Wednesday, to just feed off of each other spiritually, eat a whole bunch of food, but then feed off of each other spiritually, refill our spiritual cups. You can refill your spiritual cup <coughs> by reading your Bible, um, by worshiping the Lord, but just magnetically being around each other is so incredibly important. You can feel it when you're in a room with a bunch of uh, other Christians. You can feel it and say, God is here right now. I can feel him here. He's giving me goosebumps right now because I'm with all of my loved ones, my family. That's why it's so much fun to get together and uh, eat and just spend time together because we're family. We enjoy being around each other. More important than uh, anything else, we need the entire body to function properly. You just can't do it on your own. It, besides, it's boring. You just do all this studying on your own, and it's boring if you're not there to bounce uh, ideas off of each other. Um, but, uh, all right, on to chapter two. We're going to take a short break to hear a word from our sponsors. No? <laughs> I was going to wait to see if somebody was like, no. Life water. Are you thirsty? Perfectly pH balanced. Okay. Anyways. Uh, do you like life and water? <laughs> yes. One. Okay. Um, before we do continue to chapter two, um, <clears throat> there is so much inside of Ephesians, so I'll probably cover a few verses in the second chapter. Um, and then, like I said, we need to absorb what we, uh, we learned and, and meditate on it. Uh, I don't want to overfill us. Ephesians is so packed with spiritual truths. But before we go, I want to hear from each and every one of you. I know it's not going to be anything bad. Thomas went, <laughs> Homework. It's not homework. Not yet. It's here work. But I, I, I personally want to know which is your favorite book of the New Testament and why. And whichever one gets the most verse, uh, votes, maybe we'll do it the next. Maybe I'll cover it the next thing. And whichever one gets the, the least votes, uh, you'll be removed from the church. I don't know. I'm sorry. It's a <laughs> uh, I know. <laughs> You <laughs> tend to remove anybody. I know there's no ushers here either, so it's just going to have to be Jonathan. Um, Nicole, do you want to go first? I've got my answer prepared. I've been thinking about it for a week. Why is that not fair? I was kidding. You. I wrote this all tonight. <laughs> um, what is it? Yours is Revelations? Whoa. Why? Are these microphones on? Okay, cool. Why revelations? Because that's intense. Yeah, that's intense. And, um, is that why? Because we're watching it unfold. Yeah. Right I now. I didn't see my oh, chapter. <laughs> like, I mean, you, we're reading it. We're seeing it. And so I get that. Have you ever tried to do that? Read through revelations and parallel it to what's going on in the world right now? It's pretty amazing. The iron butterfly. Yeah. I, um, what they say is... Uh, Iron Butterfly, but you think about back then at 23 AD, if they seen if they seen an Apache helicopter, yeah. how would they interpret what that really is, except for the closest resemblance of what's in that time frame? An Iron Butterfly. So my favorite is John because the 
Bible, start to finish, one word, redemption. Yeah. John encompasses the beginning of all things created, space, matter, and time, into Revelation and the uh, six to infinite amount of time years after when time stops. It's all right there. If you could take one book and encompass what God is, who God is, it's in John. Amazing. Hey, the fullness like of the you gospel. Gave them a heads up because they were like, "Yeah, this is my favorite book." <laughs> <laughs> well, they answered. My top five is. Just you say your top five in numerical order. Yes. You will impress <laughs> me. <laughs> so no, okay. And then Revelation. And then Revelation. Is it really yeah, your yeah. second favorite? We went to a class and went. I mean, we do like three scripture or uh, three verses a night, and that was all we could get done. Wow. In one hour. It was incredible. Word for word, line for line. That's really amazing. amazing. I had someone ask me if I was going to do Revelation soon. I was like, ooh. <laughs> that, oh. that's, a, that's picking the color of the carpet in church. It really I mean, is. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Is it? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. It is terrifying. Thank goodness we're in the, the new, under the new covenant or else. I mean, because I love ham. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My and gravy. Bacon. Yes. Bacon. What, do you have one? Skip. Ms. Sue, do you have a favorite book of the New Testament? I guess it would be Luke 2 because uh, when I was about 7 or 8 years old, I belonged to this little neighborhood club, and we had to learn Luke 2, I think it was 8 through 16, which told about the birth of Christ. I've always remembered that. Amazing. Is what? What'd she say? Psalms 91. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no time in your life you can't flip to that and just feel it immediately. Is that no plague enter my dwelling place? What? Yes. Is that no plague can enter this dwelling place? Yeah. Yeah. A lot in there. My dad always told me, he said, dial 911 if something was going wrong in my life, and that's just Psalms 911. I had a situation about five years ago, and I had to live that verse to get past what I was going through. Really? I had to call my pastor at the time. He's like, Psalms 91. Stand on it. And so I had to read it and read it and say it and say it and live on it. Yeah. Wow. Got me through it. Uh, anybody else have a favorite book? Not anybody else. We're going down the line. You're taking a poll. I, well, I, I, you said everybody. They look scared. I was. I, I, they're not scared. Go ahead. First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm in agreement on Revelation. Amen. What? Uh, You're going to say Revelations? Revelations. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Now i got to go home and read it again. <laughs> Lana, do you have one? Um, Google's too slow for me to <laughs> That is. I like the book of Google. <laughs> I do, too. That's my favorite book Google's in the world. You know. Okay, but no. Um, <clears throat> so one of the verses that I've um, memorized is the James 5, 16. Mm. Um, pray for each other so that you may be healed. And yeah. Recently, I figured out that there, that was A. There's a B. And the B is because every righteous person is powerful and effective, or ev every prayer of a righteous person. Mm -hmm. So we are supposed to ask forgiveness and then confess to each other because our prayers are powerful and effective. So one, there's a community that you were talking about, but like we're supposed to pray for each other. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... I'm just going to stick to a verse. Amen. <laughs> uh, anybody, y'all down there? Shirley. Shirley. Shirley agreed with, uh, Shirley. I think no, those two were on the stage. She, yeah. she said 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Yeah. 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 Psalms 100. Really? I got to go home and read that now, too. I don't know where my, I need to start bringing a pen with me. Stephen, you have a favorite Bible book? No? Not yet. Joseph Crosby. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Kathy down there at the end there, you know. Oh, you already said you said that. What about the peanut gallery over here? <laughs> Anybody up there have a favorite book? I mean, she loves the Bible. Yeah, she's a Bible. She, she um, yes. Songs, um, Isaiah. Yeah, oh. Isaiah's got me through a lot of songs because David, he was strong, and he went through a lot of things, right? Psalms, 
Psalms 91 is a warrior prayer. Amen. That's got me through. He's reminded me several times, you know, read Psalms 91. Read Psalms 91. Amen. I cry because I thank God and he gives me tears of joy. Yes. Because, you know, we're only passing through this life. And it's in this world. But, you know, I know my God is strong and he can bring us through it no matter what. He knows it. But I, as in going for Isaiah 40, comfort. Oh. And he said, Who was it? Was it Simon? It's just Peter. 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 You know, it's Peter. Peter. Yeah, well, it was Peter. But it was, you know, Isaiah reminded me a lot of that, too. So, like, that, these are, those two books are, like, really, really, like, the biggest for me, you know, has been getting me through with God. Because, you know, God, he scares me. <laughs> <laughs> he's got love, but he's got a right. Yes. Hey, Amen. So, for bad for whoever has to go after you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went second. <laughs> there's, there's proof of the power of the word of God right there, I tell you what. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Tears is a language that God understands wholly. That is, that is your soul speaking to God directly. Um, I, that's, well, now I have to go your last. Turn. Yeah. yeah. Woo! Can I, 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 I'm going to have to say Romans probably because that's what flattened me out before God, I think. I'd, I'd read the Bible so many times and then I think not until I got to the book of Romans um, while imprisoned uh, did God lay me down on the ground and I was just on my face for a solid hour crying and I was so sorry. I felt so bad for not coming back to him. And It was Romans that did it for me, so I'd have to pick that. But I mean, it's got, it's got a lot of good stuff in it too. The, the fullness of the gospel and a lot of amazing things, but... That was wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you guys for sharing that with me. Um, I think we can probably get through to maybe about verse 3 of this chapter before we start filling our brains up too much. Um, uh, But like I said, we need to meditate. Let's read. um, Let's start with 1 here, and we'll read through 2. Okay. Um, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, too, in in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So, anybody know who the ruler of the kingdom of the air is? Satan. I love this terminology, and I've got to say it. I'm sorry I know I'm in a church, but it doesn't matter. It's not that bad. Um, the way it's saying this is like uh, God is saying, or uh, the, Paul is saying that uh, Satan is basically the ruler of a fart. And this is saying he's like the ruler of the air. He's got nothing. Um, but, <laughs> sorry, Thomas. <laughs> what? Then I just lost my job, y'all. But that's okay. It was worth it. Um, in reality, uh, the readers of this letter believed, actually, the, the uh, churches of Ephesus and a lot of different churches back then believed that Satan um, and the evil spiritual forces inhabited the regions uh, between the earth and the sky. That's a te- uh, technically why they said that. That's the uh, same region uh, that a fart inhabits. So I just say it one last time. But in this way, sa- uh, Satan is, <laughs> she's, like, she's like, you can't do <laughs> It's true. It's true. (laughs) You put the squirrel up. Great. I got to keep moving. Um, In this way, um, Satan is pictured as ruling over an evil uh, kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. Um, But the word Satan, actually, you can use devil, uh, but the word Satan actually just means the accuser. That's what he's doing. He's going around pointing fingers at everybody, saying, look what you've done. You did this. I'm like, hey, buddy, I belong to Jesus. I didn't do nothing. Uh, not anymore. In the, in the resurrection, Christ was victorious over Satan and all of his power and all of his devils and all of his demons, and we just need to remember that. Um, therefore, knowing that, we also know that Jesus is permanent ruler of this earth. Satan is only the temporary ruler of the part or the people that choose to follow him. That's all Satan has. You choose to follow Satan, well, enjoy your time there. But God's always going to try and bring you back. He's trying to, to, to bring you back into the fold. Let's get through uh, three. In which you used to live, oh, that's two. All of us also lived among them. So he's saying we were there too. You can't ever look at anybody and be like, you sinner. 
I lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Now, th it's the fact we have to deal with, like, I know I'm with Jesus now, but without exception, all people at one point uh, committed sin or do commit sin or will commit sin. Um, and that proves that without Christ, we have a sinful nature. It's just what we are, who we are. We've fallen into sin, but without Christ, we have that sinful nature. Um, we are lost in sin. We cannot save ourselves, and it's a sad fact uh, nonetheless, but does this mean that only Christians do good? Is that what that means? Does only Christians do good? No, absolutely not. Um, a lot of people do good to and for others. We have to remember that. Um, on a relative scale, take, think about it this way. On a relative scale, uh, there's a lot of moral, kind, law-abiding people. There's a ton of them out there. Uh, comparing these people to criminals, sure, we could say they're very, very good. Like you haven't murdered or stabbed anyone or done anything like that. Um, huh? You, I know, I'm always pointing at you. Uh, you have stabbed someone, but you guys have not stabbed anyone. <laughs> I'm kidding. There's going to be cops waiting outside now for you. They're going to be like, ma'am, we were watching Facebook Live, A Life Church, and you're coming with us. Wh what? Why is that good? Oh, that's a good point. No, I don't know. I don't know if I can weigh that out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> at least you know you're safe. We've all got a knife on us. Anyway. <laughs> So that's on a relative scale, okay, the moral, the kind, um, but on God's absolute scale, because we can't do anything on our own relative scale, that our life is just minuscule. Um, on, on God's uh, absolute scale, no one is good enough to earn salvation, not a single one of us. Um, remember what 2-1 said, um, jump back to 1 real quick, Jonathan, sorry. It says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Remember, he's talking to the whole church. He's talking to Christians. He's saying, you were dead to sin. So only being, uh, through being united with Christ, uh, his perfect life, uh, can we become good in God's sight. That's the only way. We're all sinners. When he, when he says, uh, oh, go back to uh, three, please, Jonathan. Um, when he's saying objects of wrath or, or uh, the people deserving of wrath, um, he's referring to those people who will receive God's wrath because of their rejection to Christ. That's what's so amazing about Ephesians. He's like, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Everything revolves around it, and without him, we are nothing. Now let's read 4 and 5 real quick, because he's talking about the people deserving wrath. But... Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. Everybody fist bump the person next to him and say, I'm alive in Christ. Amen. With, with, with gumption, you're like, I'm alive in Christ. <laughs> Anyways, um, it's just amazing because we're, we're what? We're in the fifth verse of the second uh, chapter and... Man, Paul is like a fountain of spiritual knowledge. That dude can just uh, spit spiritual truths like nobody's business. Well, we'll let it rest there so you guys can go home and meditate um, on what you've learned. But remember, go home, read this by yourself. Uh, no study notes, no assisting books. Let the word speak for itself. Let God speak to you. Let it speak to your heart. Go home and, and read one and two, or even three if you want to get ahead of the class and um, be prepared for next week. But I love you guys. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you so much for giving these books of inspiration so that when we look at our lives and we feel lost, we can go back to your word, we can dive in and be reminded what we have waiting for us. Be reminded what you did for us through Jesus. Lord God, please continue to encourage us in every way, in every day, through your word, God. Please encourage us to go to your word for every situation that we have. When someone asks us a question, God, make us go to the word and then give that to them, Lord God. Help us, help, help us to pray fervently for all the brothers and sisters of all the nations, Lord God, because we need that encouragement, that prayer. We need each other. Remind us that we are a body united with 
with Jesus Christ as the head Lord God. So no matter what happens, we can never be separated from God and we can never be separated from each other. Lord God, our hearts are connected to each other. We're an amazing family because you are at the head. We love you so much, Jesus. We adore you. We worship you. In your holy name we pray today. Amen. I love you guys online and most of you at the table. Um, we'll see you. <laughs> it's not you this time. She's got a knife. I'm just saying. Um, you guys, I'll walk you to your cars before you go. <laughs>